Hey, class, I uh, really was not feeling good about the way uh, the beginning of our class went. I think I, I just really confused everyone and uh, thought I'd just come home and just redo this video of today's lecture. In case you go back and watch it, um, it might make a little more sense. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to decide to skip the first example because, like I said in class, I think that example, the way the book approaches it, isn't very natural um, and forces us to, I guess, in the very beginning, be confused. So let's just start with this one. Keep in mind here that the whole idea behind trying to have a change of variables is the fact there's, there's actually two things. First of all, it's a way of taking a region that may be some weird shape and by changing the variables, converting it into something that's, that's more natural to work with or, you know, or easier to work with, like a rectangle. So here we get something like a parallelogram do a change of variables, it turns into a rectangle. It's easy to integrate over a rectangle. The other thing is, as we'll see in the next example, that sometimes your integrand itself, what you're trying to integrate, is not easy to integrate with the variables given. So like we talked about in class, this would be tough to integrate with respect to y, and then again, followed by with respect to x. So sometimes a change of variables allows you to rewrite this and when you rewrite it in terms of new variable, the integration becomes a lot easier. So we'll see that as we get to that example. But the, just keep in mind, those are the two main purposes of trying to do a change of variable. All right, so let's start with this. This problem says, first thing we're going to do is um, use the change of variable. So they give us this change of variable. All of our x's will replace, be replaced with this all of our y's will be replaced with this. So we're going to write x in terms of two different variables, u and v. The y will be written in terms of two different variables. Right now, we don't know where this comes from. It's just given to us. Uh, later on, we'll, we'll look at how we might come up with something like that. Here's the double integral we're going to try to evaluate. And the region d is given by the parallelogram with these vertices. So here they are. Here's our region. We're going to somehow convert it and show that it turns into this. So let me go ahead and, and tackle that now. So the first thing I've done here is I've written down what the transformations are that were given in the problem. Here they are. x is 1 fourth of u plus v. y is 1 fourth of v minus 3u. And then I went ahead and drew the parallelogram over here. I labeled the sides s1, s2, s3, and s4. So let's see, first of all, how we can figure out over here in the UV plane, what the relationship between U and V, well, I should say what the relationship of U is to X and Y, and then what V is to X and Y. So what we'll do to figure that out is we will take the two equations that were given here for X and Y, and we will work with these. So what I'm going to do is take that first equation. I'm going to multiply both sides by 4. I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to do is eventually get to a point here where I have U in terms of X and Y and v in terms of x and y. So multiply both sides by 4, right side you get u plus v. The second equation here, I'm going to do the same thing, multiply both sides by 4, I get 4y equals v minus 3u. Now I have some options here, but I'm going to go ahead and take, let's say, the first equation, I'm going to solve it for v, and then I'll come and replace that right in here. So if we solve the first equation for v, what we'll get is 4x minus u equals v. And then if we take the second equation here, replacing our v with what we just got, we'll get 4y equals v, which we just said is 4x minus u. And then you still have here minus 3u there, right there, so minus 3u. Putting it all together, we get 4y equals 4x minus 4u. And what I can do is try and get this solved for u. So I'll move the 4u to the other side to make it positive. I'll move the 4y to the right side to make uh, to isolate that 4u. And then I'll divide everything by 4. So what we get finally is that u must be x minus y. So there's our relationship between u, x, and y. Now what I'd like to do is get v in terms of x and y. So I will take this and say that v is equal to 4x 
minus u, but u we just said was x minus y, so minus x minus y like that, which means v is equal to, let's see, 4x take away x is 3x, double negative means plus y. So that's what we have for v. So that's, that's kind of what's happening here with our transformation. If somebody gives us an x and a y over here in the xy plane, right, someone gives us something over here, we will be able to transform it over here into the uv plane using, those two using these two equations here, my equation for u and my equation for v. Okay, so let's first take the first side here, S1, and let's try and transform S1 over into the UV plane. So what we notice is that S1 is actually a line segment, right? It's part, part of a line. That line actually extends, I better not use the highlighter. Um, that line actually extends like this and hits the y-axis over here. That's going to help me in a second. Um, but what I can tell is that on this line segment, my x values are stuck between 1 and 3. So that's where I get this 1 and 3. And then the y itself is, is the function of x. So this line has a slope of 1 because you go up, you can say up 2 and over 2 to get to this point from one point to another. So um, that's why I have y equals 1x. And then the y-intercept here is negative 4, so I just put that right here. So that's, that's what we know about y. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is ask myself, Okay, well, what's u then? Well, u, we said from over here in the middle, is x minus y. But we just said that y was equal to this, x minus 4. So that means that u is equal to x minus x plus 4. The x's cancel and you just get 4. In other words, when we are on this, when we are on S1, we know that u transformed over there on it, when you're on S1, U will always be 4, so it'll be health constant. Now let's ask ourselves what's happening with V. Well, V is equal to 3X plus Y, but we just said again Y was equal to X minus 4, so that means that 3X plus X minus 4 is equal to V, so V must be 4X minus 4. So those are the two results we have when we're on S1. We have that U is equal to 4, and we have v is equal to 4x minus 4. Okay, so let's let's now let x vary between 1 and 3 and see what happens to u and v. Now, of course, u never changes. It's just constant. It's 4. But as x changes from 1 to 3, v changes. If x is 1, we have 4 times 1 minus 4, we get 0. And then what we have is if x is 3, we get 4 times 3 minus 4 is 12 minus 4 is 8. So what's happening here is that my, my u is held constant at 4, but my v is going to change from 0 to 8. So if I go up here to my picture, we said that u is going to be held at 4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to count by, let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4. I'll call that 4. U is 4, and the V, we said, would have to go between 0 and 8. So let me count up here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There's 8. So what we have is U is stuck at 4, and V goes up and down from 0 to 8. So that line segment, is, it's not S1, but it's what happens to S1 as it's, it's mapped over through this transformation. So this transformation takes S1 over here. All right, now we have to do that for all of the remaining sides. We need to we need to see what happens to S2, S3, and S4. So let's talk about S2 for a moment. For S2, let's take a look up there. For S2, let's let's try and figure out what the slope of this um, line is. We go down one, two, three, four, five, six. So negative six over one, two. So negative 3x, right? My y is going to be negative 3x, and then my y-intercept on that would have been, let's see, we'd have to go, you could look at this slope as going down 1, 2, 3, and over 1. So you could look at it as going over 1 and up 3 also, which would put me at um, 8. If I did, I'm off the graph, but it would be up there at 8. 
So I'm going to put my Y intercept plus 8 there. All right, so that's my Y. Now, of course, the X there on S2, my X is between 1 and 3 again. So X is bounded between 1 and 3. And then I'm going to figure out what happens to you when I'm on S3. So u again was x minus y, but we just said that y was equal to negative 3x plus 8. So we get that u is equal to uh, 4x minus 8. And then v was 3x plus y, and again y was negative 3x plus 8. And then that's going to equal 3x's cancel. I just get 8. So what's happening here is when we're on S2, my x is going to go between 1 and um, negative, sorry, 1 and 3. And then my y is going to be basically this, this function of x. And when we transform that, my u is going to be somehow a function of x, but my v is always constant at 8. So now let's let, let's let x uh, start here at 1. If x is 1, we get u is equal to 4 minus 8, which is negative 4. And then if u is 3, we get 4 times 3 is 12 minus 8. We get positive 4. So basically, my v is always going to be constant at 8. And my u is going to switch from or change or vary from negative 4 to 4. So let me go up to my picture. My v is always at 8, so always up here somewhere along this line. But my u goes from negative 4 to 4, so I need to go negative. Let's see, that's negative 2, negative 3. Here's negative 4. So I'm going to vary from negative 4. Oh, I want that in blue. From negative 4, it will vary all the way to positive 4. And so that is the, that's what happens to S2 through this transformation. And now I have to go and do S3, and I have to do S4 which just to be thorough, I will do. If you want to fast forward through this, you can. So let's take a look at what's happened here on S3. I'll try and squeeze this work in here. Let me see if I can make a little bit of room. Might be able to make a little bit of room up here. Yeah, just a little bit. Okay, so on S3, let's see what happens. On S3, we have a line has a slope of 1. Um, oh, let's look at the x values. The x values go between negative 1 and positive 1. So x is between negative 1 and positive 1. And my y is a function of x. It is just slope being 1. We said here's the slope. And my y-intercept is 1, 2, 3, 4. So there's my plus 4. So what happens to u? Well, u is equal to, we've said this several times, but I already forgot u is x minus y, and because y is x plus 4, this becomes x minus x plus 4, which becomes negative 4. So u is constant when we're on S3, u is a constant. And v is 3x plus y, which is 3x plus x plus 4, which is... 4x plus 4. So let's let x vary here between negative 1 and 1. If x is negative 1, then this becomes uh, 0. If x is positive 1, it becomes 8. So basically what's going to happen is that my v is going to vary from 0 to 8, and my u, of course, is going to be held constant at negative 4. So u being negative 4 is this, and I go from 0 to 8, which is that whole side right there. And that's going to be the, that's what happens to S3 as it goes through this transformation. And finally, S4. So S4 is here. On S4, my x values are between, let's say, negative 1 and positive 1. And then my my slope here is negative 1, or no, I'm sorry, it's actually negative 3. It's negative 3x, and my y-intercept is 0, so I don't have anything out there. So we can talk about what happens under this transformation.
u is equal to um, x minus y. So x minus y is negative 3x, so you just get uh, 4x. And then v is equal to um, what's it? 3x minus uh, 3x plus y, 3x plus y, but y is negative 3x, which gives you zero. So here your v is going to be constant, and your u is 4x. If x is negative 1, right? If x is negative 1, you get that u is uh, negative 4. If you get x is positive 1, you get u is positive 4. So your v is always going to be constant and your u is going to range from negative 4 to 4. You can see, you know, you probably knew this was going to happen, but if, if v is 0, you're down like this, flat, and then u being negative 4 to 4 basically closes that box off. Okay, so now what we've got is with this change of variables, we see that this parallelogram in the xy plane becomes a, a really, really nice rectangle, in actually a square, right, in the... Um, in the uh, UV plane. So let's go to try and figure out what this integral is. Remember, what we're trying to do is this right here. So we're going to transform this and see where we go. <clears throat> okay, what we're trying to do is the double integral over D of, uh, uh, sorry, I hit the wrong button there, of 4x plus 8y dA. Now, with change of variables, it's going to be the double integral over our new region, which I'm going to call S because that's what we used in our formula. And it's going to be our function evaluated at x of uv and then y of uv. So those are our transformations for x and y. And then we have the um, Jacobian determinant here. So the Jacobian determinant is going to be the absolute value of partial of x with respect to u times partial uh, y with respect to v minus partial x with respect to v times partial y with respect to u. And then we have um, du dv. All right, uh, so what we're going to need here is our our x and y function, and we're going to have to take some partials. So x, remember, was one-fourth um, u plus v, which, of course, is just one-fourth u plus one-fourth v. And then our y function, I'll distribute this right away. It's one-fourth v minus three-fourths u that was given to us in the original problem. And that way I can now find these Jacobian uh, pieces, right, these partials. So what is the Jacobian determinant here? It's, first of all, the partial of x with respect to y. That's this one. I mean, sorry, partial of, of x with respect to u, which would be this one up here. Take the derivative of, of this with respect to u, which gives us one-fourth times now the partial of y with respect to v. So I'm looking at this one right here. Partial of that with respect to v is just the, the, the constant in front of v. And then minus partial of x with respect to v. So now I'm going to look at this again. Look at the constant in front of the v there is one-fourth. And then partial of y with respect to u would be this. Look at the constant in front of u, which would be negative three-fourths. Now I want the magnitude of that. So I get 1 16th, and then minus minus is plus. We get 3 16th, which is 4 16th, which is 1 4th. So we know the Jacobian determinant is 1 4th. And we are pretty much there. All we have to do now is rewrite this integral, replacing our x with what our substitution was for x and our y with what our substitution was. That's basically this right here. That's what this is saying. And then put in the Jacobian determinant, put our limits of integration, and we are set. Okay, let me first put in the limits of integration. So remember, go back here. It was a rectangle, so it doesn't matter which, which we do first. Um, let's say our u here is between 
negative 4 and 4. Our V here is between 0 and 8. So that's the order I'll do them in. Negative 4 to 4, 0 to 8. And just remember that that means we're going to go dv, du, because you have to match up the outers with, with the correct um, limits of integration, then the inner with the correct one. OK, so inside, I have the function 4, and then x, but x was actually going to become 1 fourth u plus v. And that's, that's it for um, 4x. Then I have plus 8 times y, but y is 1 fourth v minus 3u. And I'll move those up there, not in line. And close that out like that. OK, now that's pretty much it. I don't think I want to take that any further, because we can pretty much do it from here. I will try and clean this up a little bit. That's just u plus v. And then over here, this is a 2. So distribute that through. You get plus 2v uh, minus 6u dv du. And then you can combine things together. You get double integral, uh, negative 4 to 4, 0 to 8. Let's see. I'll go 3v minus uh, 5u. And dv du. And that should be it. You could, of course, take this the rest of the way, but that is the idea here. All right, let's take a look at the really the last example here. And, and all this uh, note here says in class is that, you know, in the previous problem, we were given the transformation right here. But what if we aren't given that transformation? And in general, you wouldn't be. So how could we come up with that? And it says here the integrand itself might clue you in on what we could try. And then finally, it says here, to make sure that you remember that linear transformations take lines to lines. What this means is that if this transformation that we make up is linear, that is, you have x becomes, um, x is in terms of u and v, and u and v are to the first power. And over here, same thing, u and v are to the first power. It's not quadratic or anything like that. Then it is a linear transformation, and all linear transformations map lines to lines. So like here in this problem, we had, we had um, you can actually do it with this slider. Let me show you. We have that, look at this black dot here. Watch the way it moves. It matches up with the black dot over here. And just watch how th that line on that side becomes the, the bottom of the rectangle. And then if we go up to the top there and move over, you can see that line matches up that line. So all lines go to lines, and, and in fact, anywhere anywhere on the transformation um, region, lines will go to lines. So we just keep that in mind. Um, we always like to have transformations that are linear because we know that it will be easy when we map it over to just determine, OK, it's just a straight line somewhere. Let's figure out what that line is. OK, so here's the integral. Use change variables to find this on this trapezoid. Well. I'm going to need to draw this trapezoid, but let's just make a note that right now, it would not be easy to integrate this with respect to y. We talked a little bit about that in class, but you can try it yourself. That is not an easy integral. So let me draw my trapezoid. I haven't done this yet, so you're going to have to bear with me while I do it. Um, bring up my grid again. This worked out pretty good. Bring up my x, y plane here. And my trapezoid, my points are 1, 0, which is here, uh, 2, 0, which is here, um, 0, negative 2, here, and 0, negative 1, which is here. So here's what my region looks like in the xy plane. I didn't talk about it in the last problem, but you can go back and look at it. Um, neither one of these regions are um, type 1 or type 2. It's some combination of both. So you'd have, to, if you wanted to stay and do the problem in, in terms of x and y, you'd have to split this up on, you know, do multiple integrals. Like you would have to split it, let's say, 
right here and then say, okay, that right there is a type one and you have a top and a bottom. And then over here, this one right here is a type one and then you'd have a different top and a different bottom. But, you know, we're not going to do that because we already know that the integral itself is hard for us to figure out. So we're going to have to do this change of variable. Um, let's talk about what this change of variable should be. So we go back over here and we recognize that the problem here is that we have x's and y's in the top and x's and y's in the bottom. If my whole numerator turns out in my new transformation to just have u in it and my whole denominator just has v, then we don't have the variables trapped in the top and the bottom separately. So let me try this as a transformation. I'm going to replace, um, I'm going to say u is equal to that top, x plus y, and I'm going to say that v is going to be x minus y. So let's just see what happens if we do that. I mean, we know that the new double integral will become this, u over v. And we like that because now when I integrate with respect to u or v, we should be able to figure out what that is. So it's a good start. Now let's try and figure out um, what this is going to look like if I try and map it over to this new uv plane. So here's my attempt. There it is. Okay. This will be my uv plane. And let's pick some some sides here, S1, and let's figure out what happens to S1. Well, the first thing we note is that on S1, again, we have a line. It has a slope of 1. Um, my x value varies between 0 and 2. The, the linear equation for that is y is equal to x minus 2, because that is y-intercept of negative 2. And so now let's determine what happens to u and v. Well, u is equal to x plus y, but we just said what y was, so that's x plus x minus 2, which is 2x minus 2. My v is x minus y, which would become x minus x minus 2, which is just the x's cancel. You get a double negative, becomes positive, so my, my v becomes a constant. So when we are on S1, my v is a constant at 2, and then my u is going to change by um, using that equation or that uh, function of x to x minus 2. If x is 0, this thing turns out to be negative 2. If x is 2, this thing turns out to be positive 2. So we know over here on the right, if v is held at 2, which is up here, right, my, my u values will go between uh, negative 2, which is here, and positive 2, which is here. So it would look more like this right there. Okay. Now we need to do S2, see what happens there. So let me call this S2. Now S2, there's kind of something interesting happening here. On S2, um, our x values go between 1 and 2. And our y is the constant 0 function. So that means that our u is equal to, remember, x plus y. But we just said that y was 0, so that's just x. And our v is x minus y, and we just said y was 0, so that's x also. So our u is going to change with respect to x, and our v will change with respect to x. And because they're both equal to x, I have u must be equal to v. Now, u equal to v is the identity function in the uv plane. It's the diagonal, just like y equals x is the diagonal in the uh, xy plane, u equals v is the diagonal in the um, uv plane. The only restriction is that if, if, if x is 1, then that means both u and v are both 1. If x is 2, that means u and v are both 2. So my identity over here, my identity, u equals v in the uv plane, looks like that. But my x's and, um, sorry, my u's and v's can only go between 1 and 2. So that means they have to go, here's 1, and then here's where they're both 2. And that means that this segment here is what happens to S2. I forgot to say that this is what happened to S1. Okay, let's try S3. <clears throat> S3 is here. Actually, I'll bring it up here. 
S3. So in S3, our X is between 0 and 1, and our Y is equal to X minus 1. Again, it's just a, a line segment with a slope 1, Y intercept of negative 1. My U is X plus Y, but Y we just said is X minus 1, so we get 2X minus 1. My V is X minus Y, which is X minus what we just got there, X minus 1. So that becomes a constant 2. So what's happening is that my, my V is being held constant at 2, and my X is going to vary, I mean, I'm sorry, my Y is going to be a function of X. Now if X is 0, we get negative 1. If X is 1, we get positive 1. So that looks like on the right side, my v being uh, my v being held at two um, is up. Uh, did I do that right? Uh, hold on. X, oh, sorry, my mistake. Had a little brain fart there. This is a one, not a two. Um, the x is canceled. Minus minus becomes uh, plus. So that's that is my v is one instead. And my and the u values are stuck between we said uh, negative one and one, so that's going to put us right here. V's are stuck between negative one and one, and my u or, sorry my v is held at one. My u's are between negative one and one. So that's the map of S3 over. And then finally S4, which is this side. On S4 we have that x is always zero. And we have that y varies between, let's see, my y is negative 1 there, and then it goes down to negative 2. So let's talk about u. u is x plus y, but x is 0, so you just get y. v is x minus y, but x is 0, so you get negative y. So if, if we have that u is equal to y, but negative y is equal to v, we could say negative v here is equal to y, right? This is the same here. And that means that u is equal to y, but y is equal to negative v, so u is equal to negative v, which means that it's not the identity, it's not the diagonal with the slope 1, it's a diagonal with the slope negative 1. And then again, if y varies between negative 1 and negative 2, then my u is going to be between negative 1 and negative 2. And my V is going to be between positive 1 and positive 2. So just try it. If, if, if Y is negative 1, then U is negative 1. And V is negative negative 1, which is positive 1. So that would look like the segment. Remember, it's going to be the diagonal over here, but negative slope. My u is going to be between negative 1, I'm sorry, yeah, negative 1 and negative 2. So that's between here and here. And my v is going to be between positive 1 and positive 2, which is basically this distance. So it's this piece right here. And then we can take that out. And that's the map of S4 over here. OK, well, <clears throat> so far we have the region. Uh, converted over. Um, it's not a rectangle, but that's okay. It is a type 2 region, because if we look at it this way, we basically have a function on top here, a function on bottom. Now I will take these out of here. Now let's just write down what those functions are. Now what I'm going to need to do is write these, um, you know, remember what we would say is this is u equals x, right? Uh, sorry, uh, not u equals x. We would say that this is v equals u. And this one over here is v equals negative u. But because it's a type 2 region, we do not want to write it. We, we do not want to solve for v. We want to solve for u. So u is equal to v. And over here, we'll say that u is equal to negative v. The analogy here is that if this were x and this were y, then we would have been saying here on, on this one, y is equal to x. And over here, we would have been saying um, y is equal to negative x. 
And then, because it's a type 2 region, we, want, we would want to solve each of these for x instead. So you'd say x is equal to negative y. And then over here, you would say, well, x is equal to y, same thing. It's the same exact concept, except we're switching, we're replacing our u, um, our x with u. And so that gives us this. And we're replacing over here our, um, our y with v. So we get this one right here. So that's just to kind of explain where, why things happen like that. But, all right, now <clears throat> let's see what is our restriction right now. We know that our, our, our u values, that's our left and right values in here, are stuck between these two things. So our u is stuck between negative v and positive v. And then our v values go from here to here, which is just from 1 to 2. So I'll put that on top. My v is stuck between two constants. So this is looking very much like a type 2 setup for a double integral. We still need, though, at this point, to come up with the um, double integral that represents this transformation. So we started with a double integral over some region d. We were trying to do e to the x plus y over e to, I'm sorry, over x minus y, dA. This is now going to become a new integral over some new region S of f of x of u v y of u v. So the, that's our transformation. And then we had the Jacobian, the Jacobian determinant, and then du dv. All right, so we need this Jacobian determinant. And to get the Jacobian determinant, we need to have we need to have our transformation solve for x. Right now, our transformation, if you go back up here, we have what u was and what v was, but we don't have those in terms of x and y. So we're going to have to do some work on that now. So starting u equals x plus y, v equals x minus y. What I'll do is I'll take this equation. Let me solve it for x, u minus y equals x. And then I'm going to plug that in over here. So v equals x, but we just said that's u minus y. Then we still have minus y. So we get v equals u minus 2y. Let me solve that for, for y. So I'm going to move the, the 2y to the left, u minus v on the right. Then I have y equals u minus v over 2. So that's what y is. To figure out what x is, I can come here and replace my y with what I just got. So it's u minus y, but y we said was u minus v over 2. So x is equal to getting a common denominator here, 2 on the top, 2 on the bottom. 2u minus u plus v, be careful there with your signs, you combine these together, over 2. That's x equals, what is that, u plus v over 2. Okay, so that's our x and that's our y. And what that's going to allow me to do is get my Jacobian determinant. My Jacobian determinant, again, is going to be partial x with respect to u, partial y with respect to v, minus partial x with respect to v, partial y with respect to u, which for us, now working with these up here, maybe it will help if I clean these up. This is 1 half u minus 1 half v. This one here is equal to 1 half u plus 1 half v. All right, so what's the partial of x with respect to u? That's this one here. Treating v like a constant, we just get 1 half. All right, so that derivative of that was 0. Then partial of y with respect to v, which is up here. With respect to v, we get negative 1 half minus... Now, partial of x with respect to v, that's this one. Treating u like a constant, we get the 1 half out there in front. So 1 half. And then partial of y with respect to u, which is derivative basically of that one, which is 1 half. So we get negative 1 fourth minus 1 fourth, which is the absolute value of negative 2 fourths, which is 1 half. So our Jacobian determinant is 1 half. I'm ready to put the integral together. 
we have double integral. I'm going to use the limits of integration. We'll come back from, from this picture right here from this. So we're going to go 1 to 2 and then negative v to v. 1 to 2, negative v to v. Then our function e raised to the, now x plus y was replaced with u. And um, x minus y was replaced with v. And then we have our Jacobian determinant, which was 1 half. And then d, d, let's see, I want my 1 to 2 were my limits on u. Or, sorry, on v. And then, so v will be my outer integral, which means I have du dv. And then I can pull out the 1 half, and the rest is kind of up to you now. And if you want, you can look in the book. Where is that damn book? I think the book works through the rest of this. Let me see here. Yeah, they do somewhere. Yeah, one to two. So this is on page 748. They finished this problem out. So, um, yeah, a D to the U over V du dv. All right, so that's pretty much it. Um, and I really hope that that clarifies things because I I rarely leave a lecture and feel the way I did today, and, and I felt like I didn't really do my job explaining this stuff well enough. So um, I put some time in it tonight to hopefully make things a little better. Hopefully your homework will go better. And uh, if you have any questions, just let me know.